So this is a public hearing to discuss the FY20 budget for Waitley Elementary School. Um, I am Katie Edwards, I'm the um, chair of the school committee. And just a reminder that w what we're, um, everything is gonna be taped today. So just to make sure everybody is aware that whatever we say will be public. Um, so the way this will work is that Judy is gonna, Judy Hull, Dr. Hull is gonna present the budget to us. And then afterwards there's gonna be a chance for people to make comments. Um, and then a chance for the board the committee to ask questions. And then after that we will have our regular school committee meeting. So um, with that, anything else? I think I'll hand it over to Dr. Hull. Thank you. Okay. I'll pass these out. I'll just have to send those along. <coughs> so what you have in front of you is um, the proposed budget for FY20. Um, one scenario played out, and then we'll talk about a second scenario um, in a couple of minutes. Um, so just to kind of go through the document, um, on page two, um, you can see sort of uh, the 30,000 foot view of the changes to the budget. Um, as um, the committee is well aware, we have run into an issue where we're very close to the tipping point with school choice where expenses are starting to outpace revenues and that some of the changes in the FY20 budget are to help um, mitigate against that being sort of what we call the funding cliff um, that lately could fall off of. So we want to make sure that school choice is in a healthy place. So that's why some of the changes are um, the way they are. So uh, in the area of salaries, um, things that are subjected, subjected to collective bargaining, um, including steps, and um, the committee has put in a slight uh, adjustment for um, potential cost of living adjustments as well as steps. Um, the uh, adding of an additional uh, special education instructional assistant uh, shifting funds back from uh, from uh, you know to classroom teachers um, to school choice and then um, you know all of that then created an increase of 9.707 percent in the um, collective bargaining piece long-term substitutes we had put some money in that line um, that line has been adjusted back down so that's what it is that decrease um, non-union increases, um, there's some change in cost share, um, as well as um, being mindful of the fact that for 12-month employees, the work year is usually 260 days, next year it will be 262 days because of leap year, and an extra Monday that winds up coming into play. Um, and then administrative, it looks large, but it is really because of the fact that um, Mr. Modesto is in the process of hiring a full-time business manager. I work for a company called The Management Solution, and we are here as an interim business uh, manager, so um, money was shifted from the salary position for the school business uh, manager into a contracted service, and we're shifting that money back into salary, so that's why that increases there. Um, as we look at um, the operational changes, I won't go through uh, the little teeny ones, but the, again, the big one, if you look at finance and administrative services, you can see um, the downtick there um, because the TMS contract will end on July 31st, so there's a month overlap with the new business manager. So that just, again, reflects that shift back up into salaries. Um, we've shifted some uh, things from uh, curriculum development stipends, um, you know, and those of things in terms of uh, just making sure that, that uh, lines, as we look at projected expenses, um, we're taken care of. Transportation, um, the bid in, uh, that we received um, is actually $2 per bus less um, for next year than it is currently for this year. But uh, again, part of the school choice issue that we came across was that there was some out of district special education, both tuition and transportation that was being paid from from the school choice. We're starting to shift some of that back into the local budget again to make sure that school choice does not wind up in a place that we don't want it to wind up in. Um, so uh, custodial services, just some increases in health, uh, in uh, supplies, um, some projected increases in terms of utilities and maintenance to the buildings, um, 
And then just some minor increases in dental health and life insurances, not so much because of rate increases, because actually the Hampshire uh, Council of Governments is going to hold fast on the rate increases, but to again allow for shifting in plans um, to have a little bit in there um, just to make sure that that's fine. Uh, pages three and four is uh, what's known as the cherry sheet. Um, for those of you who don't remember back to the day when cherry sheets were mailed, they came on cherry pink paper, that's how they got their name. So um, this is what the state process is in terms of determining both revenues and assessments to the town of Waitley over time. Um, right now, all we have in hand is the governor's budget proposal. Um, and so you can see there is a slight increase in Chapter 70 aid, which is the aid for public schools. Um, <coughs> You can see that um, there is no charter of tuition reimbursement because there is no charter of tuition being paid out. Um, school choice tuition is down by about $50,000. Um, and you can see uh, some other things that go on with the town. So the total estimated receipts to the town are down from 752566 last year on the cherry sheet to uh, $670,247. On page four of the cherry sheet that shows the assessments, these are things that are charged by the state to the town. So, um, you know, there's not a lot. A lot of this uh, applies to more of um, larger um, municipalities. But if you look down at the bottom of that page, you can see the school choice sending tuition um, is down because there are less students choosing out um, that are of this age bracket and you'll notice that there is no uh, charter school sending tuition going out at this point so again when you look at the net difference it's about a seven thousand dollar downturn of um, revenue coming into the town um, when you put all of those things together so um, just to explain the school choice issue on page five of um, the budget you can see that uh, there's a balance forward of $205,912.44 that was reconciled between our accounting office and the town accountant. Um, there were some accrued payrolls uh, over the summer months from FY18, so the actual net balance moving forward in school choice was $192,259.25. The anticipated revenue uh, for school choice is $230,393. Every, every December, there is a, an adjustment to school choice that comes out. So there's a reconciling of who claims choice students. And so this is down a little bit from what was uh, originally estimated. Um, every December that adjustment takes place. So when you look at the total uh, revenue and balance forward uh, going into this fiscal year, we're looking at $422,652.25. Um, so you can see what the budgeted expenses were, what the anticipated expenses um, are moving forward. Um, that we have an anticipated balance moving forward of $102,260.17. Um, looking at the initial school choice um, revenue of $230,393, uh, $230, excuse me. Um, so making total anticipated revenue for <coughs> FY20 of $332,653.17. Um, proposed expenses, we have done some things to be able to uh, ensure that we're not going to outspend um, revenues coming in, and so we have an anticipated balance moving forward um, at potentially at the end of uh, fiscal year 20 going into the next budget year of $38,413.46. So as you can see over time, the school choice balance rolling forward to every new school year keeps dropping because the expenses are going up and the revenue is not coming in. So uh, one of the things that the committee has been mindful of along with Mr. Modesto is making sure that we have some sort of buffer moving forward so that if school choice revenue is lost, and it doesn't take a lot to make that happen. It could be a couple of kids, um, the, the base uh, that school choice students um, generate in terms of revenue is $5,000, but there's also a special education increment. So if the child receives special education services, those are charged back to the sending town. So sometimes it does not take much 
for those um, numbers to shift. So we wanted at least some positive balance moving forward. Um, on page six, you can see um, both the school choice receiving and where students are coming from, what the rates are in. So right now there are 43 students um, choosing into Lake Elementary School. And currently there are nine <laughs> students choosing out of um, Waitley into other uh, schools. And you can see that um, as well. On page seven, a lot of the, uh, several areas of the budget are determined by cost share between the entire region um, with both um, Frontier and all of the elementary schools put together. And then there are some costs that are just shared at the elementary level. And so every year we figure out what those percentages are based on enrollment. And you can see that both in um, the Union uh, region, where uh, all five cost centers are involved, Waitley has had a slight downturn in its percentage, as well as the Union 38 uh, percentage with just the elementary schools. So things that are um, district-wide or union-wide expenses um, are shared based on enrollments. Um, and then the rest of this handout is um, basically a line-by-line -line budget item. Um, and so just to kind of help explain how this is laid out, uh, at TMS we believe in a transparent budgeting process, so we use an approach called an all-funds budget. So we show the actual cost of something, and then we show how things are offset. If you're looking to compare FY19, the current year we end to FY20, Look at the two blue columns. That's really the true picture. The pink column in the middle is more of a, a larger look. So particularly if you look on page nine, um, you can see, for example, classroom salary, classroom teacher salaries, and the pink column is $485,686, but the local share of that is only $386,965. And you can see that it is offset um, by school choice and by the REAP grant. So you can see how that all plays out. Um, and there are other areas in the budget as well. Um, early childhood teachers, you can see that there's an offset with early childhood revolving. Um, so that blue column represents what the actual cost is uh, to the town of Waitley. And the same thing is true on page uh, 10. You can see some of the offsets with people with and assistance language and so on, and you can see the funds from which those um, accounts are um, charged. Um, if we look to the very bottom of the budget, which is on page 14, um, at the end, um, you can again see um, how school choice is going to play itself out. You can see the estimated balance moving forward for FY19, um, the estimated revenue for FY20 at the top of that page. You can see the total that's being charged, which is $294,240, and the anticipated balance moving forward. Um, same thing true of early childhood revolving. You can see the balance forward <coughs> on the anticipated at the top, the estimated revenue from that, which is uh, early childhood tuitions coming in, what the expenses are, what other expenses might be, and what that anticipated balance will be moving forward. So the total change to just the Waitley budget, not all of the other moving parts, is $103,925, or a 6.18%. So that's um, the totality of the budget. Now, there has been discussion back and forth about what gets presented to the town and so on and so forth, and could we get the 6% to be a little bit lower than, uh, the, than what it is. And after much painful uh, deliberation, uh, the school committee came up with a second scenario, which is what this one page handout is. I didn't redo the whole budget workbook, just a summary of that. Um, <coughs> basically, um, the big change will be a reduction of the guidance psychologist uh, position from a 1.0 full-time equivalent to a half-time equivalent. And the impact of that on the budget would bring down um, the change to 3.9%. And that's that. <laughs> we are working off this scenario yes. today, so yeah. we're working with the 
four scenario is what we were hoping to we we're planning to bring to the planning at this point. So at this point we're um, here the public hearing is to hear from the public. Um, so we'll open it up for any comments that people would like to share. I just wanted to comment, make one comment beforehand that I really appreciate everybody's engagement in this process and um, I think it's a great sign of the health of Waitley Elementary. We've gotten some really thoughtful letters from the, both the teachers, the staff, and the parents. So um, that's been great. And we've had some really good conversations and work with the administration on all of this. So I just want to thank everybody before we get into more discussion. Um, so I guess we need to open the hearing. Do we have a motion to open the public hearing? Motion. Second. All so at this point, if there's anyone that would like to make any comments, we would be happy so, to uh, listen to them. I'll go first. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Jennifer Kellogg, and I am the third grade teacher here. Um, I'm also the building rep for the union. Um, and we are here in support of Dr. Sundberg's position, um, standing 100%. Um, I know that this process is challenging. Every year you guys have to come up with a budget that is pleasing to not only us, but to the townspeople, and I know that's not always a big task. But our goal here is to basically convince you how important her position here is. Um, and if her position were to be cut by 50%, the outcome would be pretty devastating. Um, students walk through our doors uh, with a variety of social and emotional needs, and Dr. Birch is quite frankly, our preventative care person in that area. Um, her role here is vital, and it's irreplaceable. Um, she's a valuable resource to students, teachers, and parents. And she has a unique way of connecting with every single child in this building, and that's not an exaggeration. She does. She connects with every single child here. Um, study after study shows that students um, who do not have their emotional and social needs met um, are not available for learning. We see that day in and day out. Um, her role here is to provide the support to not only teachers, but to students and parents, um, so that students are readily available for learning. Um, what she brings to the table is, is really irreplaceable. Um, and to have her cut, again, by 50% would be pretty devastating. Um, I know that, that the, school choice students have dropped um, and that there's been talk of you know really promoting the programs we have in this building well what she does here is one program that will attract school choice um, families um, I just wanted to give you a breakdown of what her uh, work week looks like here um, in a 35-hour work week, um, Dr. Birch's schedule is as follows. 11 hours for individual counseling. Eight hours for psychological testing with the scoring and the report writing of this process done at home. Five and a half hours for 11 group counseling sessions. Four hours for team consult meetings with classroom teachers. One hour for IEP and 504 meetings. Two hours for phone consultations with parents and outside providers. 2.5 hours for additional consultations with teachers, school nurse, other staff, which includes developing and monitoring behavior plans. Um, we can't say enough good things about what she what she does for us and for the our school community. Um, we're all grateful to have her here. We know what kind of a unique school we have here, and we want to keep it that way. Um, and I think that Dr. Birch could probably tell you a little bit better about what her role is here um, and, and how she supports us. So, I'm Cindy Birch. <laughs> um, I feel strongly that the services I provide to the children here at the school enhance the value of the education that they receive here. And yes, I do provide specialized services to children with a whole range of disabling problems such as anxiety disorders and autism, ADHD, and learning disabilities, but I also provide a full complement of preventive service. Um, many of the children I service don't qualify for IEPs or 504s because they're making sufficient academic progress. Um, I'd like to think that part of that is due to the preventive services that I provide. 
Um, those services make it so uh, that children are available to learn um, and that their teachers are more available to teach. Um, I try to make preventive services available. I do make them available to all children of the school, and that includes not just their teachers in terms of consultation, but guidance and support and referrals to their families as well. The psychological testing that I provide is comprehensive to a level that you will not find if you try to outsource that service. I know this because I get calls on a regular basis from other districts to provide psychological testing on the weekends because they can't find providers in the community uh, where the wait list is a year. And for the record, we are not the only school in the Valley or even in our district that has a full-time psychologist counselor position for a school of our size. I know because I've worked at several of those schools, including Palamont, Pelham, Conway. If my position is cut in half, I will only be able to provide services that are mandated by law, and those preventive services will not be ha able to happen. Um, and then I think, well, I know this position will turn into what I call a fire extinguisher model where it will turn into the person in this position will be putting out the fires or the crises um, on a regular basis and dealing with mandated service and that will be all. I've worked in many schools in my 25 years in the field um, and I feel certain that if you cut this position by half, you will find that problematic behaviors will increase, the emotional difficulties that children have will be exacerbated, the social conflicts that they have will be on the rise, and all of this will make children less available to learn and make us a less attractive school for people to come to or stay. And, and unfortunately, that our teachers will be spending more and more time, as will our principal, um, in dealing with crisis situations. I thank you for your support of this position, this full-time position, not just for me personally, but for years to come, what this position provides to the quality of the education that we give um, for all children in the school. Thank you. Hi. My name is Holly Johnson. I'm the co-president of the PTO here. Um, I have two children in the school right now, and a third who attended for six years at Chase at Frontier now. And um, I would like to speak to how important having Dr. Birch here full-timer you know, a school psychologist of her caliber here, full time, is is so important. Um, the social groups that she hosts with everyone that that um, that allows her to identify problems before they become a real problem in the classroom. It allows her to see students that would be hesitant to see her on their own, and then she can <coughs> see them in the group and really work with them. And I know that from my own children, and the, the social-emotional aspect of learning is so, so important. Over the years, I've seen my kids, when they are, are having a good social-emotional experience in the classroom, they have the teachers and help that is tuned into that, they learn better. They have a better year. They don't come home crying and not wanting to do their homework or struggling, and I've seen that over the years since my, my daughter's in eighth grade now, um, so I think that losing that, and we would lose that if she went to half time, would be really detrimental to every classroom. In the school, teachers would be spending so much more time with the behavior issues and the, the social problems that develop in the classroom just because we are a school of a small size and we see the same kids every day, year in and year out. And um, then the teachers would lose the time they need to be teaching. And um, the kids would lose how much they can learn in the classroom. Um, I would also like to speak to that she's a licensed clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. Having gone to PAC meetings with parents from other districts, and I tell them we have a licensed clinical psychologist on staff who can diagnose autism and anxiety disorders and many others, and in a timely manner, they are shocked. They are, that's amazing. They tell me that's amazing. They say, I'm on waiting lists for months and years to get my diagnosis. And my kid does not have a diagnosis, so my child cannot have an adequate IEP, and my child is suffering in school. 
and I'm grateful that we have her and that testing is available. And if you are looking to sell the school, that is a huge, huge selling point because this wait list, I hear it all the time. It's huge. I mean, and there's like Worcester and Bay State and all these places and you're calling and calling and calling and crying because you can't get a diagnosis and you can't get an IEP and your kid suffers year after year. And to have that in-house, you don't have to contract out. You don't have to worry about trying to find someone. That is huge. And I can't, we can't know if we would keep that if we put the position to half time. Um, she's here for unexpected things. Last, last year, the um, emergency evacuation of field day, that affected especially our upper wing. Um, they, they watch the news. They know what's going on in this time we have with lockdown drills. And, and to have someone on staff to deal with that whenever necessary is, is huge. Not to mention unexpected death in the community. Unexpected, maybe an actual lockdown. To have someone experienced to handle that, I think, is very important. Finally, just um, like the bridge that she creates between parents and school is huge. She has the time now to talk to us, to call. We can call. We can drop in for an appointment. We can say, my kid's not, not on an IEP. She's not diagnosed with anything. But I'm struggling at home with this. And I know she's struggling at school with this. And Dr. Birch can give advice. And she's always available. And to just have that feeling is another selling point for our school, that to have a person available full time to do that. And I can't imagine she would have that time. Um, to available if it went to half time. So I believe it's, it's very important and a huge selling point. We're looking to gain more choice. We advertise those aspects. I believe we will gain more choice. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? just wanted to say that I agree with all of you. I have also benefited from Dr. Birch and would like her to stay as well, full time. I, my child doesn't have an IEP, but we've had struggles. And she's been very helpful. So I, just one last comment is that um, <coughs> If any of you watched our finance and select board meeting, the, the great news is that the finance and select board are very supportive of the school and they're really interested in helping us invest more in the school and continuing to um, develop Waitley to be the gem of the school that we know it is. Um, the, you know, the positive, I think, has been exposing one more gem within the school that everybody really maybe didn't appreciate before quite as much and now we know how important that is. and. The only thing is that we did get a message loud and clear that we need to market the school a little bit better and to really help you know, bring in the revenues that we need to keep the school running. So I feel like this is kind of helping us all um, understand that a little bit more. And I think this budget, if we can get it passed, will be a really great step in that first direct, in that next direction. So um, I think that's it. I, just want to, I want to piggyback on what you just said with the finance board and the select board backing us you know i've been on the school committee for a long time i'm also chair at frontier so i've worked with budgets for a lot and you know mainly with the town they always want that two and a half or under and two and a half and under and we tried really hard to get at two and a half this year we were at three point something with some cuts and then when we went in front of the finance board and the select board and saw the positive thing from you know people from the finance board and the select board about having the top-notch school and don't mind a, we'll say a 6.18 percentage, I mean, that speaks for ourselves that, you know, we do, have a, we do have a great school. And I mean, I was always a firm believer with school choice money over the years back when it first started. You know, I took the, like the school choice money buying things for the kids and not offsetting it with salaries. Now it's not, I mean, Salaries are important for the kids, but we used to buy computer labs back in the day with that school choice money. Now we're paying a lot of salary. We're trying to take care of some of those salaries so we do have a little buffer. So if we need something 
for the kids or for the teachers, we can still purchase it. So, you know, the more school choice we have that we have openings for, it helps out a lot at our school. And the great news is that, that the town really values education, and I think all of us would agree that that's an important component of a really healthy town, and we're in a position to be able to support this. So I, I feel very fortunate that we're able to do that. Katie? Mm -hmm. <coughs> In regards to the school choice decrease, is there some kind of a scale from, you know, however, when we first started school choice, is there, does it tend to dip sometimes, or are we yeah. seeing a, a complete decline? You know what I mean? Is it yeah. like there, there's, there, I think there's, like I mean, we've seen curious. four or five years worth, and there's, you know, it's not a, it's not a big drop. If, I mean, if it's a big drop, it's from, We'll say from 2015 to 2018, it might have dropped five or six, but not well, five or six or seven in one year, I don't I think. I think the it's high just, was like 250 uh, and we're at 139. So I think Sorry. we're not too far off our high. The bigger problem surrounding school choice is the declining enrollment in general. So just the school populations mm -hmm. are shrinking. And because our school is so small, <coughs> any movement in those numbers is very sensitive right. to our budget. So, um, and. I'm not a huge fan of school choice because it just pulls school kids from other districts that are going to then suffer these same consequences. But you know, if this is the way it's going to be, then we need to attract as many kids as we can here. So I'm just wondering, like, has there been a dip at some point like this, and then it's come back up? Yeah, but I think the challenge is what Bob was explaining is that um, in the past that school choice money wasn't relied on quite as much, so right. we could yeah. manage dips a lot better. Right. The problem is the state isn't funding the schools, so if you want to go help fight the state too at a high enough level, and so we, we supplement what we can, but right. it's not enough to really offset those, uh, the lack of the good increases from the state mm -hmm. in general. So at Waitley's very fortunate where there's a lot of schools that are in a lot worse position than we are. But I think there's also a good recognition these days that how important education is, and every child deserves the best education they can get. So. And, and in this case, it's it's education beyond the classroom. Beyond yes, the and I think that's yeah. another recognition. Is these days life is so anxious, anxiety ridden mm -hmm. that the more we can do to improve the uh, ability to learn in the classroom, the better off we right. all are. Yeah. Thank you. And the dip in school choice is not necessarily because a lot of kids are leaving. Again, if a student has a special education increment that attaches to them, it could be instead of getting just five thousand, it might be eighteen thousand, or it might be twenty-five thousand, or it could be fifty thousand. That one child leaves, they take their base five thousand plus their increment with them, and so. It doesn't need to be like 10 students. It can be two students on IEPs that can really tip the balance one way or another. So that's why it's important to be mindful that at least some balance moving forward um, in that account is, is important. Thank you. Thank okay. you for coming. Yes, thank you all for thank you. joining us. Um, I think that's, we'll end the public hearing. Entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved.